Welcome back to this series of OWASP Top 10 videos for the 2017 list. There is an introduction if you're not sure what OWASP is or what the Top 10 is. But in this video, we're going to be looking at entry number four on the list, which is a new entry called XML External Entities. Now, this has been added due to results back from static analysis tools. So what happens is a load of companies out there who do this for their job, process all this data and submit it to OWASP and have basically said in the last couple of years, this vulnerability in XML processing has become a more serious risk to web applications. So this is the OWASP grid saying that it's relatively easy to exploit, not, com not very common, but relatively common but it's generally quite easy to detect. You can usually find out quite easily if an application accepts malformed XML. And the technical impact is pretty high because you can kind of, in the worst case, do pretty much anything. You can expose private data. You can cause denial of service. So it's you know kind of pretty, pretty serious, really, if this vulnerability exists in a web application. So if you, most of you should be aware of the XML format. So it looks a little bit like HTML. It's got triangle brackets in it. And it's effectively a hierarchical structured data file. And the format allows for external references. So it allows you to declare a splat entity tag. And in that entity, you can either define variables or you can kind of point it to external resources. So if an attacker can add or modify the entities in an XML file and either point them to some malicious kind of source or do other kinds of examples that we'll see in a minute, then they could cause a DOS attack. So there are ways of basically eating up either CPU memory or just time a number of requests by malforming the XML. So you can create a denial of service attack. You could potentially expose sensitive data. So generally that would happen from the operating system. So you could expose perhaps files, configuration files, password files, things like that. Or possibly you could delete or damage server data in a similar way to exposing it because this could potentially allow a direct um, executable to be or a, a direct action to be carried out on the file system on the operating system you could obviously delete something as easily as you could try and print it so really this is kind of hits all of the CIA in uh, data security it hits confidentiality it hits integrity it hits availability so it can be pretty serious if it gets carried out in terms of answering how common is it however it's not necessarily an easy question to answer it's much more common in older applications and that's just because certain XML parsers were more vulnerable in earlier versions than they are in later versions so as some of these vulnerabilities became known some of these have been patched and are maybe more default uh, sorry more secure by default Whereas in the older parsers back in the days where we assumed everybody played nice with each other, then we tended to allow these things to happen and we kind of turned on functionality by default rather than security. Clearly, your application would have to use XML in order for it to be vulnerable to any kind of XML attack. However, it's not necessarily something that you could see directly. It might be hidden way down in a dependency, in a library, in an API that you use. So it's not necessarily something that you directly have control over. So one example is you might be using SAML, either just for general um, assertion functionality or maybe even for authentication so that's an example of something you might not necessarily have direct control over but you should still check whether you're vulnerable to um, how these entities are injected so the tags that we're actually talking about really the you know the single place where this is a problem is uh, it can be seen in lots of different formats. So the first format would be just a simple string macro. So you could say, well, I'm going to effectively define comp name as my, comp my company, 
and I can then reference that comp name in lots of other places. So that's just a simple way of avoiding repetition of data. It would be much easier to inject one entry like this for each XML file than to do a find and replace. So that's its kind of most simple form. That in itself is generally not a vulnerability. But one of the vulnerabilities comes because you can nest these. So you could say, well, the D name or the division name is basically the company name and then web division. So it'd be my company web division. And one of the problems is you can nest these things arbitrarily deep. So that can quickly become a problem. You can also perhaps surprisingly reference external entities. Now, clearly these are designed for just providing a lot of flexibility to the people who are using XML to be able to say, well, you might have multiple services that all provide part of the data you want. So these entities allow you to pull in something from another service. So it could be an HTTP URL, it could be a URI, it could be a number of different things. It also allows, you know, kind of operating system type calls. So you could effectively reference the etc. password file. Now, clearly, this would require that your web server has access to read etc. password, which it might not have, because any file on the file system potentially would be valid as an XML entity. Another example would be rather than say a data file would be something like dev random. So dev random potentially is a, an endless file. So if you try and include it into an XML file, again, you could end up basically overflowing memory or, you know, making the system slow down or whatever. So you can see there's kind of quite a lot of flexibility and that often brings with it these types of vulnerabilities. So let's look at a couple of examples of how this could be used and why it's a problem. And the most famous example is probably this one. It's called a billion laughs. And hopefully you can see that by defining this entity here called LOL as the string LOL. So that's just a simple kind of string macro. But here, LOL2 is effectively 10 lots of this. And then LOL3 is 10 lots of this, i.e. so LOL3 is now 100 items. So LOL4 is going to be 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, etc. So by the time we get to LOL9, just because of the way these are all nested, then LOL9 ends up being a billion of this string LOL. So what would generally happen or what should happen is that an XML parser would effectively see that and say, right, what is this? This is that, each of these is that, each of these is that. So you can imagine as it's iterating, trying to find and replace all of these right back to the original string, then there's a danger that you could use several gigs of memory. You only have to do that once or twice to make a server fall over or start paging to disk or whatever. So it's kind of a classic denial of service attack. But the problem here is that it's a very easy attack. There's nothing in here that shows who the attacker is. And so this would be very easy to pull off. And, you know, unless you were able to patch your parser, they could keep doing it, um, you know, forever. And they wouldn't need thousands of botnets across the Internet to pull it off. Just this one file might be enough to bring your whole server down. A similar kind of idea, but done in a slightly different way is instead of having nested entities, you just have a single very large entity and then you just insert that multiple times. So a slightly different way of achieving the same thing and the, the same outcome would occur. That is server falling over out of memory, um, you know, system getting locked up or whatever. So they're kind of two effectively direct DOS type of attacks. An external DOS attack is a slightly uh, kind of slightly di crafted slightly differently. And in this case, rather than using nesting to multiply the amount of data that the parser has to handle, in this case, we're pointing it at some kind of endpoint, uh, either under the attacker's control or it doesn't have to be. It could just be a known endpoint. And in this example, an endpoint that you can call and that won't return anything. So you have a firewall that just silently drops the request. So, of course, what would happen here is the XML parser is going to request the data from the endpoint and it's just going to sit there waiting potentially for a very long amount of time. So, again, you only have to send this 
maybe a few hundred times, a few thousand times to a server, and you're going to lock up all of its requests because they're all going to be sitting there waiting for something that will never return. So that's a DOS attack that works on the basis of, um, of an external, uh, external URL. Another one, as we kind of mentioned earlier, was pointing the entity to dev random. So in this case, very potentially, and again, it depends exactly on your system, your OS, your parser and everything else. But potentially, this will just keep trying to read dev random and keep going and keep going and keep going because dev random isn't a traditional file. It's effectively a, a pretend file that, that generates numbers every time you kind of read from it. So again, filling up the memory, making the server fall over, assuming that this server, the web server process again, has permission to access dev random. Dev random is not generally seen as a, a problem for reading. Like most files on Linux, you'll be able to, to read it freely. So this is relatively likely to work and of course, uh, another way of doing the same thing. So this is exactly the same example, but in this case, we're trying to access etc slash password. Now there's less chance of this working because etc password is generally slightly more protected than something like dev random. And this would also require that the XML parser wouldn't just read etc password, but would also then print the contents of it somewhere that the attacker could read. Because if it didn't do that, then there wouldn't be kind of much point to this attack. So this would require a few more things to be true in a system. So this is not as likely to succeed, but it's still just another example of something we can do with XML entities. This is uh, probably the, the most unlikely attack to be successful but one of the more severe ones. And in this, we're using the PHP expect module which effectively gives you file system access to PHP streams. Um, it's one of those kind of scary things that you can't really imagine many people using it for good purposes. And the expect module isn't loaded by default in most instances, but if there's any reason why somebody's turned on that and then uses this, this type of attack, you're effectively being able to inject uh, a, you know guesses of passwords into whoever the user is of the um, of that particular stream so there's again ways of potentially trying to gain access and then if those creds succeed uh, you can then run any kind of php functionality on the server so most serious hardest to pull off but still a vulnerability so it's very hard to show you actual examples of these because trying to find a combination of things that actually is vulnerable is not very easy for, uh, you know, it's not like you can just search for which parser is vulnerable. You'd have to set it all up or find an old version or something. So I haven't bothered doing that, but hopefully these examples, you can kind of see what the underlying problem is. There are really two problems. One of them are the external types of references and the others are the, the DOS type type attacks which don't require necessarily any external um, functionality. They just require the nesting to to happen when the XML parser tries to parse the document. So most of these fixes should be fairly obvious. The first is if you can, don't use XML. Now, that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but if you are if you haven't written your system yet and you're wondering about using XML, then the answer is probably don't because it's got so much functionality, it's so flexible that it's just one of those kind of old-fashioned technologies that by trying to be all things to all people ended up becoming a massive attack surface. So if you don't need to use it, don't use it. The other thing that might um, help it's not necessarily a, a complete protection is to upgrade any xml parsers that you're using so for example older versions of .NET, the parsers were vulnerable by default so on on newer versions of .NET, those external entities are not processed by default you have to explicitly enable it whereas on the older ones they were enabled by default so it might be possible to upgrade the parser but if it's tied into a framework version that might not be quite so easy. And of course, upgrading it doesn't guarantee that you're more secure because later versions won't necessarily be more secure. They're just more likely to be.
uh, if you can't upgrade the parser to switch this off and, and even if you can explicitly disable entity processing so if you don't ever need to use those entities in your xml documents anywhere then just disable it and then the parser can either ignore them or can sometimes error if it finds one depending on what you want to do but either way the entities are not processed and all of these attacks are possible just because of that entity tag so if you can disable that all of these attacks go away if you can't disable entity processing then there's some other kind of backstops that might help you in some cases and not others so in terms of the dos that references the external um the external entity or otherwise things like dev random which is a never-ending file you could potentially set a timeout on the xml parser and effectively say if this can't parse this document in whatever 200 milliseconds then i know there's a problem because it's a tiny document it should always be really fast so then i can handle that specific situation and not lock up the request so you might be able to help uh, with dos attacks by doing that it might also help in the expansion attack but it depends how fast your server is your server might expand and you know use up all the memory before the timeouts expired so yeah, that that may or may not work in terms of the expansion attacks, the, the billion laughs and the kaboom one, if it's possible, you could set a memory limit. And again, should be relatively easy to work out if this is possible on your parser, should be relatively easy to work out the kind of amount of memory you would expect the parser to use. And that might be settable in general. It might be settable specifically for an entity memory limit. So you could say if the entity ends up being more than you know 500 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes or whatever then effectively stop processing and throw an exception or whatever you could also use whitelisting so if you kind of say well i kind of am doing some weird and wonderful stuff i do need entity processing maybe i don't really know how to use memory limits or timeouts maybe they're not possible then what you could do is you could override the way that the parser actually processes your XML document and you could say well these are the only entities that you should ever see in our documents and as long as the entity matches that then I will say yes you can carry on processing if it doesn't match that I know somebody's attacked it another possible solution is to use signing you might already be using it which might help prevent tampering because the if you've done signing properly somebody can tamper with a document but should not be able to produce another signature to sign the tampered document so then the first thing you do with your upload is you check the signature if the signature fails you know you've been attacked and test any places where uploads are made so rather than kind of maybe trying out some of these things and just assuming you fixed it as with most of these solutions you kind of need to test it just to make sure it works as you expect and it should be relatively easy it's easy to find those example scripts you can create your own the uh, example xml documents and actually try it out and see whether your protections are actually working and you know maybe you then need to ask the question well what happens if somebody starts doing this even if, if the protection works Am I going to know that's happening so I can actually do something about it, like, you know, move, move the server to another endpoint or whatever it might be? So that's kind of important. If you are able to protect where these XML files actually come from, then clearly that's, a, again, a, a less desirable, but potentially that might be the only control you can put in place. So if you can't do most of these things because your software is too old or you can't fix it, then you could say well maybe we just use network segregation and we just make sure that that communication channel of xml documents is just simply not accessible from outside of the channel that it needs to use and of course you could set that up at the web server level so you could restrict it by ip address you could use you know basic authentication or something on the server so a number of different ways you can do that but obviously if you can avoid people being able to tamper with the documents in the first place then that's also an important part of how to fix it so that's it for this one please read the top 10 publication find it at owasp.org and take a look through it's got information on this and all of the other 
um, videos all of the other vulnerabilities that we're going to be discussing. It's also got some helpful pointers to other documentation, ways forward, ways to develop your process more and what to do once you've understood the top 10. So please get to OWASP and have a read up on that. And I shall see you guys in the next video. Any questions or comments, please put them below.